Welcome back to the Your Houston Podcast. This is your host, Mario Castillo. If you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button. We've got a bunch of great episodes queued up that we don't want you to miss. Today, we're going to do something a little different, and we're going to talk to Dr. Bhavna Law with the University of Houston College of Medicine about the COVID-19 vaccine and answer questions and concerns that you may have and talk about how you can get vaccinated if you want to. Uh, this is something that is not necessarily directly related to a quality of life issues like we normally highlight here on the show, but we feel like it's important to provide our listeners and folks watching with information about a very important decision. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Bhavna Law. We are really excited to speak with you today about the COVID-19 vaccine and uh, all the questions that folks may have and, and information on, on how to get it. Before we get into that, we are going to kick things off with our liftoff round. I feel the liftoff. The clock has started. All right here. All right. So you were talking to us earlier before we started in your new to Houston. Uh, so far in your time here, what's been your favorite restaurant or meal that you've had? Um, well, thank you so much for having me. I think the probably the best meal I've had is um, the Tex-Mex, which I think everyone enjoys in Houston, given the different flavors of um, the culinary flavors available in the city. But um, it's been, there's a lot of different restaurants to choose from here. So great places for carry out. Yeah, you could probably have a different Tex-Mex restaurant every day of the year here. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think so. There's that many, but it's always a solid choice. Uh, okay, what was the last book that you read? Um, I, I've read several books, so I think that, uh, I mean, I think probably the most recent books have been pertaining to public health, um, but there's nothing really, if you're looking for a fiction book, I haven't read anything that's necessarily fiction in a while. Although I think a lot of what we read online right now could qualify as um, fiction, not fiction, <laughs> depending, on who, fiction depending on who you're speaking to. Misinformation, maybe. Misinformation, <laughs> correct. Misinformation. Okay. A lot um, of that. Let's fast forward to a world where things are back to normal, countries are open, travel is, is okay. Where is the first place you're going to go for vacation? Wow. Okay. I have not been asked that. Um but I would, uh, I recently went to India before um, lockdown. So I would like to go back there at some point. And I, I would also like to go back to Europe when it's safe. I think it'd be great to actually visit places in Europe again. America. And also just see my family and friends in different parts of America. It's been, you know, we've all been isolated now from everyone for over a year. God, yeah, wouldn't that be nice to be able yes, to see? Yes, it would be yeah. um, to go visit people. Yes, it would be great. Well, you know, I hear vaccines are a way to get us there, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, if you could have a conversation with anyone, past or present, who would it be? Conversation with someone, past or present? Um, it's a hard question. I think, I think I would like to have a conversation. Past or present, I would say conversation currently, I'd like to have a conversation with Kamala Harris. I think oh, wow. she's somebody that I think everyone wants to have a conversation with <laughs> right now, but I think just everything that she's gone through over the last year or several years and to see how much she's accomplished um, has been incredible. And just to kind of see how she's feeling, taking on this role of vice president um, and being the first vice president um, of of uh, South Asian origin and African American origin, and also of um, the first female vice president. I mean, it's a huge responsibility uh, to take on, and she represents so many women throughout the country that are rooting for her. Absolutely, that that's actually multiple conversations right there. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yes. Okay. Last question: Harvard or Yale? So I've been to both, actually. I trained at Yale for internal medicine, and um, I did my master's of public administration at Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and also worked at Harvard Affiliated Hospitals. That's an interesting question. Where did... Well, that's why, that's, no, that's why we're asking you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I enjoyed both places. I uh, enjoyed New Haven, and I enjoyed Boston. And, um, and I, 
I, I think the people are fantastic at both places. All right. Diplomatic, diplomatic answer, but we'll take yes. it. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here um, and, and talking to us about such an important topic. This isn't uh, necessarily an issue that we would dive into in terms of a quality of life issue per se, per our organization, but it's very important and we want to give folks information um, about the COVID-19 vaccine and try to be a resource um, to answer any questions that people may have. And so we appreciate you being here to talk about this with us. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, so let's just start off. There's three FDA approved vaccines here in the U.S. Are they safe? Um, what's the difference between them? Can you give us an overview? Yes, definitely. So yes, um, they are safe and effective. So the three vaccines that are available are Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the Johnson Johnson vaccine. These three vaccines are, have been deemed safe and effective by Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in America. And um, they've been widely tested in their clinical trials and have gone through the same rigorous um, clinical trials that you would do for any vaccine. They're currently under emergency use authorization by the US government um, and they are free to the public. So literally anyone can sign up um, who is eligible to get the vaccine and get this for free. And I would advise everyone to get this if they are eligible um, to help get people vaccinated uh, is also critical right now, but it's, it would be fantastic if we could really encourage everyone to get the vaccine, not just for yourself, but for others and to protect others, including your family and friends. I, I got my vaccine today, actually. Oh, congratulations. Um, this oh, morning. You're doing well. And it worked Good out that this was the episode we were doing today. So That's fantastic. <laughs> How are time. you feeling? My arm is actually a little sore. It was, okay. uh, I was telling Thomas, our producer, I didn't feel anything when it happened. It, mm -hmm. and it's like a millisecond, right? It just goes in and it's done. Right. And yeah. now I, my arm's feeling a little sore, but otherwise fine. That's great. Well, make sure you stay hydrated. And um, if you feel like there's any, if you're feeling uncomfortable later, you can also take a Tylenol. Okay. Good to know. Um, so you mentioned the three vaccines. Two of them use a technology mRNA, one of them mm -hmm. a more traditional vaccine technology adenovirus. Can you explain the difference between those? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll put it in really simple terms. The mRNA vaccine uh, is a new technology, but it's been studied for several decades now. And um, these are the the two. This is these are the vaccines that are using this technology, this new technology. But um, it has been studied for a long time in uh, in different ways. So this is not necessarily a new technology. It's just the first time we've actually seen it in the vaccine. Um, and basically, what happens is once you got that injection today, the mRNA went in, and it um, is for the next next few days. It's going to be transcribing this protein. Um, called um, a, a part of the protein that's similar to the protein that's in the um, actual virus called the spike protein, which are, if you've seen those pictures, there's those little red spikes that are on outside of that little circle. Um, so it's basically transcribing little bits of that. And then whenever you are around someone that may have COVID um, or may have the virus, sorry, may have the virus, if you get exposed to that virus, you're going to have these antibodies that were made from having transcribed that protein. So that protein is there. And then because that your body realizes that protein was made and it's not yours, it's foreign, your body then made antibodies. And whenever you're exposed to the virus, now you have those antibodies that are gonna say, this is not, you know, I, I'm here to help protect you and they will neutralize um, that virus. So what's also beneficial is that mRNA gets discarded. So it basically writes that protein and then it gets discarded, it's trashed. Hmm. And it does not enter the nucleus of your cell. So it does not interfere with the DNA of your body. It does not genetically interfere with your body. And I think that's been a lot of concern to a lot of people is that, oh, well, what if this interferes with your cells and your DNA and are we gonna be genetically modified? And the answer is no, we're not gonna be genetically modified. I got the vaccine in December and January second dose and I am not genetically modified. Um, so I'm proof of that. So I, I really want to encourage people to realize that it is it is not messing with your DNA. I'm glad you brought that up because that is that something. That is a misinformation campaign that needs to stop. Yeah, that is something that's been around social media as a, a concern for folks. And then there's this Johnson & Johnson adenovirus. Can you explain mm -hmm. that? 
Yeah, so same concept. Um, the denovirus vector is basically used um, as a way to get uh, the, again, that sort of writing mechanism into your, you could say into your body. And then it also encodes with that part of the spike protein. And again, does the same thing. So it's going to, it's going to make antibodies. And the next time you're exposed, you're going to be able to neutralize the virus with the antibodies. So the difference with the denoviral uh, vector is that um, there's also an Ebola virus vaccine, Ebola virus vaccine that actually uses similar technology. So there's another vaccine that is similar as well. But they're all safe. They're all effective. If you yes, have the opportunity to get one, take it. I cannot stress that enough. If you have the opportunity to take any of the vaccines, if, some, if somebody says, we have a vaccine available for you today, you should just go and take it. You should not be questioning, no, I should wait because I want to get this other one. Um, I would not wait because you don't know when that next, that next spot is going to be there for you. And we don't have the luxury yet of saying, well, you know, if you don't get it today, you might get it next week because the short, there are major shortages right now in the vaccine. So it's really just, um, it's on a week to week basis that we're finding out what places have vaccines. So if somebody's offering you the vaccine at a spot, I would just take it. And um, they're all safe and effective. And the, the main thing that all three of them do is that they prevent hospitalizations and deaths. So even though one has um, a lower efficacy rate, I know I love to have a lot of discussion about this, but Johnson Johnson has a lower efficacy rate, right. but don't forget that Johnson Johnson vaccine has been around and tested during the variants that were spreading in the UK and South Africa and Brazil. So we do have less efficacy associated with that because of um, they were tested during this time, but they also have 85% effectiveness in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And that's, I'm sorry, hundred um, percent effectiveness in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And that's what we want to emphasize. 85% effective overall, um, but hundred percent preventing hospitalizations and deaths. And that's throughout where all of them. And that's the main thing, right? Like if you are exposed to COVID right now, well, not, you just had the first vaccine, so you're not completely protected until 14 days after your second shot. But the fact that you've been, ex let's say you're exposed to COVID even later on mm -hmm. after the second shot, even if you develop mild symptoms, that's better than being hospitalized, right? That's better Absolutely. than being hospitalized on a ventilator or, um, or permanent or consequences such as death. I mean, that's what we're trying to prevent here is preventing hospitalizations and deaths and preventing collapse in healthcare systems. We don't want to have more healthcare systems overrun, um, more doctors and nurses and other healthcare professionals overwhelmed. And we also don't want other, a lot of people that I personally know, and I'm sure you know as well, have really um, postponed a lot of their care, unfortunately, because they're worried about COVID. And we're seeing the rise now in preventable illnesses, like people missing their colonoscopies, people missing their mammograms, people yep. missing outpatient procedures, people not going to their doctor's appointments. And now we're seeing the results of like um, uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled hypertension, even, um, and a lot of uncontrolled conditions that could have been prevented. So if we want to prevent the collapse of healthcare systems, we need to get people, hosp um, we need to get people vaccinated so that we can actually help healthcare systems function and do all these other things that we used to be doing before COVID. You know, exactly. Like going for regular checkups and having people hospitalized for conditions that they needed to be hospitalized for it, not treating them at home. So at the end of the day, all three vaccines, 100% effective at keeping people out of the hospital and preventing death. Yes, according to their data, correct. Okay. So we, you, you talked a little bit about uh, concerns with altering DNA and how that absolutely can't happen. Um, let's address a couple others that we saw out there while we were doing research for this episode. Um, can this vaccine, either of the three vaccines, is there any way that they could cause long-term uh, harm to you down the road, years down the road or months down the road? So I'm, I mean, as you know, we are all in this together with COVID. Um, we are learning as we go along, but there is no data to show that we're going to have long-term consequences of these vaccines. Again, there are They've been um, studied in the lab, studied in per people as well through clinical trials. And um, there's no evidence to show that these are going to have long-term effects okay. from what we know right now. So I, I am a strong believer in getting vaccines for in general. But I think at this point, um, this is our only way out of the pandemic is if we develop, if we get herd immunity through vaccination. So right now we're at 12% vaccination in the country for fully vaccinated. And we really need to get to 70 to 85%. Um, 
so at, at this point, I think um, there's, there's really no other option besides vaccines. If we want to go back to normal and go back to a normal functioning society, I, I really think it's, it's vital to stay on point and realize that um, we don't have any proof for all these social media campaigns mm -hmm. and all these misinformation campaigns going around right now. And I've read a lot of them and it's outrageous. I mean, I, I can't even believe the conspiracy theories that people are coming up with. It's, it's really, it takes some creativity to come up with these things as well. And I, um, I, th this is not, this is not a way to manipulate the world by vaccinating people. There's no microchips going into people by vaccinations. Um, there's no tracking mechanism through vac vaccination. There's no nanotechnology being inserted into you. Um, there's no, there's, there's nothing that's going to, uh, manipulate anything for circumstances later on. So, any data, any evidence that these vaccines are causing infertility in men? No. And I think that's another, that's another misinformation campaign. There's been no data to show this is causing infertility. And American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology have actually issued statements on this as well for infertility, because a lot of people have been talking about this. There's no data to show that this is leading to infertility. Um, and ACOG is actually publishing statements on um, vaccinations for pregnant and breastfeeding women as mm -hmm. well. And I can send you that link as well to discuss. And they, they recommend, uh, given pregnant women have a higher chance um, for developing senior, severe illness with COVID, it is recommended um, by ACOG to take the vaccine if you're in a high risk population, especially healthcare workers, et cetera. Okay. So talking about obtaining the vaccine uh, for folks in this area, Houston, Harris County, yeah. if they're not sure if they qualify or they want to find out how they can sign up, I know that there's not a centralized, you know, federal rollout, but what can they do? Where are the resources that they can go to, to ultimately get a vaccine? Yeah, so I will send you these websites as well. But um, right now, starting Monday, March 15th, so individuals age 50 and over are eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine in general. And before that, it was age 16 to 64 with certain medical conditions as well. Um, and if you go to the uh, Harris County Public Health website, you can also register for the vaccine. You can go to houstonemergency.org slash COVID-19 vaccines to register. Texas Vaccine Hub Providers List um, as well. It's another site that you can go to, Texas COVID-19 Vaccine Availability Map. Is another one and there's other hospitals and health systems also publishing this information on their websites houston methodist memorial Hermann, fort, Be fort bend county health department galveston county health department st luke's utmb lone star family health center um uh, st luke's health woodlands hospital cvs pharmacy also is offering vaccines heb walgreens so um you can go to any of these and uh cvs has a lot of spots as well you just have to sign sign up um online. The thing is, I think what's really would be helpful is the people who are listening can also help their fellow elderly um, to actually sign up for these vaccines. A lot of us are more tech or like tech oriented than a lot of the elderly that are trying to do this. So if you can help your friend, relative actually register for a vaccine, that would be really helpful as well. So we'll link to all those resources that you send us. That'd be great. Um, and we can just create a page with all of that information that we'll link to. But essentially, you're going to need to get on as many of these lists as possible. Yes. And I, I would even describe your own experience. How did you get on? How did you get on to this website and get a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, that well, thanks for asking me a question. Usually, I'm on, <laughs> only the one asking questions, but I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, I signed up for Methodist. I signed up for the city of Houston, the county, uh, UTMB, which was ultimately the one that I got on. And they emailed me. They said, you're uh, available, you know, for your, your, your name's up on the list. Can you be here at one of these times? And I, I went this morning. That's great. I drove through. It took about 45 yeah. minutes. I never got out of my car. Um, and it was a bit of a drive because I live in Houston, but yeah, I mean, it was worth it. And how many websites did you go on? Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many new patient portal accounts I've created with various right. hospital systems and, <laughs> and right. I have right. a Sam's club thing that I've created. I have yeah. a CVS. I, ha I mean, all of them, all of them. But I, it just, this is just shows you how difficult it is, right. To actually get a vaccine. And I think, this is something that we really need to work on because there's so much vaccine inequity going on because there's these elderly patients that have no idea how to actually get on these websites. And um, we need to get these vaccines to them. 
So I, I think it's really, uh, University of Houston and Lone Square actually did a, um, but we did a vaccine clinic a couple of weeks ago at um, Holman Street Baptist Church. And that actually was really helpful because it was in a church and it brought people together in a local area and got them a vaccine. And I think that's what more people need to be doing is getting these vaccines out to the communities that have actually been, have actually been affected the most. Um, I mean, all of us have been affected, but some communities have really been hit hard and populations, minority populations have really been hit hard and they have no idea some of them how to register. So um, the tech savvy amongst us are really competing for these spots, but a lot of people have no idea how to do this. Like, I, I mean, people are waking up at four o'clock in the morning to get onto these websites for CVS, Giant, Walgreens, just to get a spot, which is, um, if you can stay up all night, that's great, but not, an, an, not like a 95 year old cannot do this. That's such a great point. And so we will we will put all that on our website and encourage folks, even if you've already had your vaccine or you, maybe you just don't want to get it for whatever reason. Uh, you know, there's ways you can help others. Maybe you're not yeah. you're not up on the qualified list yet, um, but, you know, folks that are, you know, there's ways we can assist them. Because, I mean, it was, I, I helped my dad, you know, right. get his. Yeah. And if it wasn't for me, he probably wouldn't have. Yeah. Uh, because, I mean, I help my parents. I help, I've helped my relatives. I've, all my cousins have helped my relatives. I mean, people have literally stayed up all night to get, to get spots online, which is, it's been really challenging. So did you uh, experience the vaccine rollout in Boston at all? No. Or, okay. I experienced, I've been in Houston since July. Gotcha. Okay. But I'm, my uh, relatives live in Boston, so I've heard a lot about the vaccine rollout there. And they've had some great ways that I think we could use in Houston. Like, I've just been um, hearing about different things. So when 75, they started realizing that 75-year-olds couldn't actually register themselves, they developed a companion um, sort of, uh, basically, if you brought a 75-year-old to the mass vaccination center, you could also get vaccinated. So which else, oh, okay. which ended up working out, right? So you would help get this 75 year old and over person online, get them an appointment, give them a ride and bring them physically to the center. So you've actually, and then you've also vaccinated a huge age group. 18 to 49 is a age group that's actually helping spread the virus as well. So you've va vaccinated two people at the same time. Um, and that's helped everyone out. Very clever. Very clever. Yeah, I think we could do that in Houston too. I mean, a lot of elderly people still need the vaccine. You talked about the variants that the virus has now uh, mm -hmm. earlier. Are the yeah. are the vaccines that are approved just as effective against those variants, or um, are we seeing any um, drop in um, efficacy because of the variants? So, um, because of the spread of COVID, because the virus has been spreading throughout the world, we mutate. This virus has mutated, and there's been a lot of variants that have developed. And that's why we've heard so much about this over the last couple of months is that um, the virus has spread uncontrollably throughout the world. And now we have these variants. So the ones of significance called variants of um, variants of concern include, um, and I'm sure you've heard this on the news, the South Africa variant, the Brazil variant, the UK variant, now the California variants, <laughs> the New York variant. And Houston was one of the first cities to have all of them. So we are one of the first cities to have all five variants, which is which is great um, lucky, lucky for spreading us. the virus more. <laughs> no, it's not great. It's actually terrible. But uh, I, what is also concerning is that because we were in the first cities to have all variants, we need to be really careful in how um, we we need to continue to stay cautious and we need to continue to maintain COVID precautions. So it's really concerning that people are not wearing masks. Um, we need to continue to wear masks. We need to continue to practice social distancing, especially given only close to 12% of the country is vaccinated, fully vaccinated. So by prematurely removing these restrictions, we're actually um, increasing the risk that we're going to have a surge. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and, I, and, and you talked about the variants. So these vaccines right now, um, per what the companies are saying, they are still effective at, um, they're still effective so far. Uh, some not so effective at certain variants. Um, specifically, there was some concern about the South Africa variant, mm -hmm. but they're studying this in the lab and it's really it's really going to be seeing how this plays out clinically in the population so in the lab there was not as much neutralization of the um variant with the vaccine antibodies and what we don't want to happen is that th it's very simple in a in a very simple term simple terms you have a virus that's spreading this virus will continue to mutate if it continues to spread if it continues to spread and there's more mutations more variants will form 
eventually the reason that everyone keeps talking obsessively about these variants is because once these variants are formed, there might be a variant that we won't be able to tackle with these vaccines. And we don't want to get to that point because then all this effort that we're making in vaccinating the whole country will be difficult um, to overcome. Then we'll have to go. There is there is this, there is a, a real, um, real plan right now that people are really discussing about whether we need to have another vaccination booster in mm -hmm. a couple of months to deal with the variants. So it's really important that we we already have enough variants to be concerned about. We don't need any more. And the more that we can stop this from spreading, the better it'll be for all of us. Gotcha. Okay. So And the UK variant, the one that has been the most concerning, mm -hmm. is going to be probably the most dominant strain in the US within a couple of weeks. Oh and wow. It's doubling within a every of weeks. ten days. Yeah. So the more that we continue to not mask and continue to not social distance, we're going to spread this virus more. And the UK variant is planned to become the dominant strain in a couple of weeks. And as you all know, the UK variant is more transmissible and potentially more lethal. And we've already seen Europe already having lockdowns. So Italy went on lockdown yep. and other countries are getting concerned as well. We're already having an increased um, caseload right now as well in many states in America. So um, this is completely not over yet. We are still in the middle of a pandemic. And it's really just a matter of a couple of months. So if people can just hold on for a couple more months and stay patient and continue to mask and social distance, we might be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel if we can get more people vaccinated. It's just a matter of being patient. And I think people are just getting so fatigued, yep. unfortunately, that they're thinking we're done. And we're not done. We're so close, but we're not done. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Um, yeah. not. Not done yet. Yeah. I've heard that there's uh, some comparison with the flu vaccine from people that are hesitant to get the COVID vaccine. Either they've gotten the flu shot many times and they always end up getting the flu or uh, there's concern that the vi the vac COVID vaccine might give you COVID. Is that so? Is that comparison fair to make between the two vaccines? And is there any reason to believe that getting the COVID vaccine will give you COVID nineteen? No, the COVID vaccine has no live vi the three COVID vaccines that we have right now in America. There's no live virus in them. They cannot give you COVID. Um, and uh, the flu vaccine. Also, I know a lot of people get concerned about taking the flu vaccine because they get these flu-like symptoms. And some people develop symptoms from vaccines, just like uh, we develop symptoms of the COVID vaccines an immune sort of response. And um, people think, oh, I just had the flu because I had the flu vaccine. That's right. not necessarily true. And um, unfortunately, given the population, given the population of people that we're vaccinating for flu as well, and, and um, how prevalent flu can be when we're vaccinating, a lot of people might just develop viruses and flu coincidentally at the same time um, or a couple of days after the vaccine. But don't forget the, the flu vaccine actually dampens um, the response you would have to when to get flu. So if you're going to get flu and you have the vaccine, you're likely going to have a, um, a better course in the disease. Right. And same with COVID. I mean, right, if you are if we're going to vaccinate you with COVID vaccine and if you develop mild illness, it's okay if you develop mild illness and um, you'll you'll have a couple of days where you you won't be feeling as great but at least you won't be hospitalized and you won't we won't run the same risk of death as we do right now because right now young people think that oh i if i get covid i won't have any symptoms but that's not true we've seen young people also die from covid yep um so this is not just oh if i'm young i'll be fine um i think people need to stop being so acting so invincible um and realizing that we are literally dealing with a lot of unknowns with this virus. So it's better just to get the vaccine. I've had friends that are athletic and in shape, work out, and they ended up getting COVID and they've ended up on oxygen. So, I mean, you just, you never yeah, you know, it's a know. brand new virus. Um, right. Can you tell us about side effects that, that people are experiencing after their first and second dose and, and what people can expect? Yeah, so great question. Um, a lot of people have been really concerned about side effects. And with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, what we've seen is that uh, people, for the most part, are having more side effects after the second dose. But even with the first dose as well, you can have a local reaction. So that's right where you got injected like today. Um, you can have some redness or swelling or pain at the injection site. And um, you can also have some systemic side effects. So that includes headache, nausea, fatigue, muscle joint pain. Um, some people have fevers and chills. But these are happening more um, more routinely with the second dose, although they can happen with the first dose. 
But again, these side effects are really transient um, for the most part. They last one to three days in most people. And um, they are easily, uh, by the fourth day, you might not even realize that you had a vaccine. So a lot of people just wake up. Like uh, for me, I actually felt some side effects. And by the fourth day, I was like, oh, I feel completely back to normal again. So if you do have side effects, they are transient for the most part. And you can take, um, I, would, I would definitely drink lots of fluids and you can take Tylenol as needed when you actually start having these side effects. And um, of course, if there's any concerns, you can also speak to your doctor if you have any concerns about the side effects. And there are some contraindications too for taking the vaccine. So if you do have allergies um, to polysorbate or polyethylene glycol, uh, it's recommended that you speak to an, your doctor, or allergist, immunologist before you take um, the mRNA vaccines because there could be, there's a concern for a severe allergic reaction with those two components. So you don't, you don't want to necessarily take the vaccine if you have an allergy to any of the components of the vaccine. Gotcha. And you can discuss with your doctor regarding this. And also with the, um, with the cases of anaphylaxis, so a severe allergic reaction with Pfizer, Moderna, a lot of people are concerned about that as well. They have, there has not been that many cases per million associated with um, Pfizer and Moderna as people think. So it, it's in the uh, less than 10 per million for both of them. Um, cases of anaphylaxis for Pfizer and Moderna. And with Johnson & Johnson, there's been no cases of anaphylaxis reported. And same with um, Johnson & Johnson, the side effects are similar, fever, chills, headache, nausea, um, muscle aches, joint pain, and, um, and local site reaction as well. And these symptoms, again, are transient, resolve um, within a couple of days. And what's great about these three vaccines is after two weeks after the second dose for Pfizer and Moderna, and after two weeks after the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you are considered now fully vaccinated, which means that you can also um, interact with other people who are fully vaccinated. So this is a huge plus for all of us who've been waiting to see our friends and relatives. Um, so if you're fully vaccinated, you can interact with your other fully vaccinated friends and relatives. One step closer to back to normal. Yes, correct. Um, <laughs> while we're talking about vaccines and, and encouraging people to get vaccinated, is there anyone who should not get a vaccine? Yes. So there is the, the people that I told you about. So if you are allergic to any components of the vaccine, you have to discuss this with your physician, your doctor, um, or your other providers. And um, also, you can also speak to an allergist immunologist regarding if you have a concern for an allergic component, that you're allergic to this component of the vaccine, whether you would still, you should still go ahead and take the vaccine. In certain circumstances, people are still taking these vaccines um, under medical supervision. So you might wanna be closer, you might wanna take the vaccine in a hospital setting where there's, you're closer to emergency care, or you might need um, medications in advance, et cetera, to be near you. So you just have to clear this with your physician, allergist immunologist, if you have one to discuss if you're allergic to components of the vaccine. And also if you're allergic, to, if you've had an allergic reaction, severe allergic reaction, immediate severe allergic reaction to the mRNA vaccine, the first dose, you also need to be cleared by your physician before you take the second dose as well. So really the allergy, the allergic reaction is the main concern, but there's no other medical condition or- um... No. Anything There's no that. other medical conditions that even if you're immunocompromised, I know a lot of people have been concerned, oh, well, I'm immunocompromised, should I still take the vaccine? You should still take the vaccines even if you're immunocompromised, uh, given you are at higher risk for infection as well. You can speak to your doctors about this regarding which vaccine they prefer you to get. Um, if there is any preference, I would still take, say take the one that is given to you because there's such a shortage. But if you're concerned, talk to your doctors about which one they would prefer that you get if you're if you're concerned about the immunocompromised state. But if you're immunocompromised and elderly, those are the people that we really want to get vaccinated because they're also highest risk. One more question before we get to our Houston, we have a problem segment. So okay. if there's someone out there listening or watching, they're on the fence, what's your, uh, your pitch to convince them to get vaccinated? I could say a lot about this, but I will say, um, I'll say what, if I had one sentence, I would say that we've watched, we've watched just in America alone, over 500,000 people die from this virus. If you know that you have a vaccine that could save your life, why would you not take it? I think that's effective and sums it up. Sums it I mean, up well. I, I just, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing that I can't understand myself. If you know that you could die from this, why would you not take something that could save your life? 
Well said. Okay, so we're going to move on to our final segment of the podcast, which is called Houston, We Have a Problem. Okay, Houston, right. we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Okay, so we're going to throw a hypothetical out and, and see how you would respond to this. Um, this okay. is, uh, you know, just to get uh, some insight into your thought process. So, uh, as you know, there hasn't been... Uh, at least when the vaccine was rolled out, a national federal standard program. Uh, but you are now in charge of a federal national vaccine rollout plan. What would be the first three things you do to uh, get this program up and running and operational? Okay. So anything I want. Yep. You're in charge. Okay. You have all the resources. So, I have all the resources. Okay. So I would, I would organize a national strategy. I think that is what was lacking from the beginning is that there was so much focus on developing this vaccine, which is great. We have amazing vaccines, but there was no rollout plan that was there from day one. Um, and there was just chaos. So I would say organize national strategy, meaning every state do the same thing and every state organize in the same manner. And we have the same the recommendations that we're given for age groups, priority groups, are consistent and standard throughout the country so that there's no um, difficulty for one person and people are not crossing borders and state lines to get vaccines and staying up all night in cars. Um, it, it's just, it, it was just chaos. As you remember, like we had 75 year olds in different states staying up all night waiting in lines for nine hours in cars. So I would say nationalize um, the plan and make it a national strategy and make sure all the recommendations and um, age groups and priority groups are, st are, are standardized. And we do the same thing in each state. Yeah. And we continue the same COVID restrictions in each state. And second, um, that was my second uh, plan yep. of action. And also not lift those restrictions until we see the percentages slowing down consistently in every state. And so there's a national strategy on when you're going to remove the COVID restrictions, including mask mandates in each state of the country. You know, it seems simple enough and common sense, but for whatever yes. reason, we're having trouble. <laughs> and then I would also say, and third strategy I would say is that make these vaccines accessible. So not have a tech rollout um, that is, you know, websites crashing, people having to log in at three o'clock in the morning, have it so that everyone who needs a vaccine, we have community health workers that actually go out to these communities and vaccinate different communities who are in need at the same time so you don't have this disparity of people who have a computer or iphone who get the who get the vaccine first and people who don't have these technologies um who get vaccinated who are not even vaccinated yet yeah. who are like in their 80s and 90s well it sounds like lessons learned from uh, experience we're all going through at the moment and hopefully we won't have to do this again anytime soon but but we uh, might and i think that's yeah. something to think about is that we have to plan for the next pandemic because this could happen again in, with a different virus. I mean, this is not the end. Um, we've had pandemics before. So this is just the one that has taken such a stronghold over the world, um, but in our generation. However, we could have another one soon. So we really have to make sure that we learn from the lessons from this pandemic and apply them to the next one. Well, thank you for taking time to be with us today and sharing uh, your knowledge and your expertise. And I hope that with this podcast, we've been able to answer some questions, to address some concerns, and, and give folks the information they need to get vaccinated if they want to. Thank you so much for having me, and um, good luck with your second dose of the vaccination. And I would just like to say, tell everyone, don't wait, vaccinate. If you have the opportunity, um, get vaccinated so you can help yourself and protect others that you um, care for as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Law, for being our guest today. And uh, to everyone out there who's wondering, where's Nick? Uh, he's feeling a little under the weather and we'll be back soon. And the show isn't the same without him. So we want him back as soon as possible. Uh, I hope this was an informative episode. Getting uh, vaccinated is not a decision that you make lightly. Uh, you know, I got my vaccine today. And it was something that I felt like was important to do and, and wanted to do that in an informed way. So we will commit to putting uh, all the resources that Dr. Law talked about on our website. We will link to that. 
uh, to help you get the information you need to make the best decision for you and your family. Uh, we thank you for watching. Don't forget to like our Facebook page, check out our YouTube channel, uh, and all the information you heard about is going to be on our website, www.yourhue.com. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>